the goal today is to understand uh, the IP addresses. First of all, what is a notation? So we're going to see that there's a special notation, given that the length is 32 bits. Okay. Um, we're going to understand that actually uh, the IP addresses are hierarchical, so which means that we have a prefix, and we're going to understand how do we allocate or learn about the prefix. Uh, the reminder part of the IP address is a host ID. So regarding the allocation, we're going to study the classes. Then we're going to study another classes because the classes have been uh, dropped. And we're going to understand that uh, addresses are super important because this is what we're using, what we use when we, when we do forwarding. Right? So let's start with uh, the network layer. So as you may see, the network layer have several parts. So we have the IP protocol. That's one thing. In the IP protocol, we need to study what we're going to do today, what is the format of the addresses. Then we're going to have the structure of the packet. Then how to handle the packets. Sometimes we need to drop them, we need to modify the headers, and things like this. On top of this, we have the routing protocols. Why? Because when we receive a packet, so this is a packet here, with a destination address, we need a table. And the forwarding table is basically out of all the interfaces of, of a node, we're going to know on which one we should forward the packet. Right? And uh, another protocol which has been added is ICMP protocol, which is actually to do ER reporting because IP is best effort, which means that if you drop a packet, if something goes wrong, IP is totally silent. It's quiet about it. So we added that specific protocol just to add an easy way to do diagnosis and to know what other problems that have been encountered. Okay, so as you see, it, it's a big part of, uh, of, uh, of any uh, network of the internet. And basically, this run on the end host, but as well the routers. Okay, you remember that TCP was only on the end host, and starting from layer three is on every node, including routers and end host. So, Okay, I, I just don't want to spend too much time on this because we're going to focus on IP, but we need to know that actually when it comes to the service provided at the network layer, there are multiple ways of doing this. So either we have a stateful service which require a connection or a stateless. And when it's stateless, this is what we're doing with IP. And that's the reason we call it datagram oriented. So what do we mean by connection oriented? It means that, as you may remember, we're going to fix a path. And on each node along the path, we're going to do some reservation regarding the, re the required resources. So it means that you can have space for the CPU, for the buffers, for the bandwidth, and things like this. So which means that since you need to allocate those resources along the path, you need to fix the path, and all the packets will need to follow that path. When it comes to internet, still it's stateless. There's no way I can keep some states regarding some packets. So what we do is we don't have any reservation, which means that if we don't have enough bandwidth, if we don't have enough CPU, if we don't have enough memory, means that we have congestion, we drop packets. In that case, there's no congestion. Why? Because we already have allocated the bandwidth so that it will be always available. In that case, there's no reservation. So which means that if there are too many packets, we drop them. Big deal. So the simplicity of this is justifying that the fact that in internet is much better. What is more, if you drop the path, if you lose the path because the link is down or one of the nodes, you lost one of the nodes, there's no path available anymore. So you need to set up the path again and start over. In the case of IP, since we handle packets one by one, even if you lose a path, IP will adjust and find a new path without needing to interrupt the service. Yeah, there may be a transit period where you may lose packets, but that's going to be short. In the case of the stateful path, you lose it. So you need to wait to set it up, which takes time. What, what we do in, in IP, so what is really important is to have addresses. So the addresses will basically ID all the nodes in the network. And when I have a packet, 
So the packet is such a size that actually is suitable with the MTU, you remember, the IP packet will be encapsulated in your brain, giving the maximal size of, for instance, Ethernet frame. Most of the time, packets won't exceed the 1500 bytes for the same reason we have the MSS and TCP. Okay? All the networks, I give you just an example, ATM is another type of network, which is not internet. The packets are way much smaller. Okay? But in IP, yeah, most of the time is about a thousand or fifteen fifteen hundred bytes. So it's important to use the IP address. Why? Because basically the IP address of the destination and the source are included in the header of the packet. And based on the value of the address, you go in the forwarding table and you check which entry match the destination. So you do a lookup and based on the idea of the interface, this is how you send it. So I'm sorry, but in that case, I don't know why I put this one, but it's supposed to be here, right? So this is not good. This is a good one, right? So that's the reason I send it to two because the destination matches that entry. Anyway, so this is how it works. So in order to create those entries, we already said we need to study the routing protocols and we're gonna understand how routing protocols create a path and gonna populate this table with all the entries that we need. So for now, we're going to consider that those tables are available and that in the header of the packets, we have IP addresses. So let's look about the addressing. So first of all, it is an identifier. And it's a specific one because it is a locator. What do we mean by that? It means that giving the address, I know where is a node located. And depending on where it is located, I may design a path that whenever I need to send the packet to that destination, we'll follow that path. So it's important to have the address because this is how I'm going to compute the path. And without any path, I cannot forward the packet. Right? And the same goes to when you need to uh, reply. So the destination receives your packet. To reply, you provide your IP address as a source as he can reply to your packet. Right? So when you need in a, in a network or in computer science to define an ID on address, there are multiple questions that we should answer. How many addresses? That will depend on the length. As we said, the IPv4 IP addresses are 32 bit long. So which means how many IP addresses do I have in total? Two power 32. And that's not enough. We are running out of those IPs. There are not any more IPv4 addresses available for no one. All right? now how do we allocate the IP address? So it means that who will decide which IP address should I use? When I, buy, when I have my phone number, when I buy my SIM card, the SIM card comes with a phone number. In the case of IP, yeah, when I buy my computer, there's no, there's no IP with it, right? So that's the reason I pay an ISP. And when I have my box, the box will learn the IP address for my home. So your house have an IP address that is provided by the ISP. And that IP may change. Okay, some providers, they will guarantee that you're using always the same IP. Some others, they will make you share this IP with other subscribers. And some other ISPs may change your IP over time. So everything depends on what is your ISP, okay? But anyway, whoever helps you learning what is your IP is your box. So the internet box that you're using is the one who is, actually is not configured on it, but it's gonna learn it, okay? So, Okay, so this is how you define uh, the IP. So if the IP is not allocated forever, you need to decide how long is the IP valid. Is it gonna last for an hour? Should I changing one hour later? Should I basically, you know, um, change it? Okay, but what is for, for sure is if you change location, you move from one network to another, you cannot reuse the same IP. So IP addresses are just like landline phone numbers, okay? So it's not mobile, so it doesn't follow you. And we'll see that those have a lot of problems, all right? Um, then uh, what else uh, is, okay, so how we learn about it and um, how do you know about the destination? We already know that this is about the DNS, right? So the DNS will let you learn the destination, the IP destination based on the name because that's what the user is gonna provide. But what about your IP address? Okay, we're gonna see that we have a specific protocol which is called DHCP, but that will come in two weeks by now. So, okay, so let's make a parallel and look at the postal 
addresses. So if we are in China, for instance, okay, so like in most part of the world, we have the country, then we have the zip code that indicates the area that I belong to, the province, the city, the district, the street name uh, with the number, and then the room, and then whoever occupied that room. Okay. So as we may see, this is hierarchical, right? So or everybody in China share the same information here. Everybody in Shanghai will share, I don't remember, it's 220. I don't know, in the zip code in China, what is the information that actually ID China, uh, Shanghai? The 20 or 200? I don't remember. Can anybody tell me? Okay, part of the number will ID the fact that it's Shanghai and some other part of the zip code going to indicate that this is Pudong, right? So there's a separation. Okay, so as we may see, so what is super important to understand is like a country is divided in cities. Each city have an ID, which is in the zip code. And each city is basically, or even we have provinces and the provinces are divided in cities and so on. So it means that the way I define my, my address depends on how the country is divided on different areas. And usually it follows the gathering of the population. So people gather in cities, but these cities are part of a province, and the province is part of a, of a country. Right? And the, the address is following the same organization, the same structure. The same goes with phone number, and I'm not talking about the mobile phone number, but as you may know, even the phone number, when I, when I give a call, right, is zero, zero, then, if it's one, this is the US. If it's eight, this is Asia. If I have a three, this is Europe. And if you have another three, this is France, right? So as you may see, even the phone numbers, they have been allocated in such a way that actually it follows how um, the country are organized together and how within the countries, I may have different areas. So you can see here for China, you have different areas, okay? And the phone numbers will start with a specific number after the uh, 86 that will indicate in which city or which province you are. So the question goes as follow is like, okay, so why do we have this correlation between either the phone numbers and the addresses with the areas of a country or at the side of the worldwide? Why do we do that? Well, we do that because basically we improve how we deliver mail. We make it faster and the same with the call routing. So we do it just because it's so much easier, right? I pick up my phone. We know if, the, if it's a local phone number or international number. So I can basically process a call at the very beginning. And as I get closer, this is how I'm going to inspect more numbers, more digits in the phone number. So if we do that, it's because we need to improve the routing or the delivery of mail or phone calls. And we do that such as it's scalable. Okay. We want to achieve a system that actually doesn't depend so much on how large is a network. Okay, And it, to make it scalable, we use uh, Yaki. Right? And this is exactly what we do for IP addresses. So let's try to understand because there are three main reasons why we make them hierarchical. So first of all, let's discuss about the size. So IPv4, 32 bits. So it means that we have four or a little more than 4 billion IP addresses, and they are not enough. So that's the reason since then we have IPv6, and those are 128, 2 power 128, which means that I think that there's a calculation somewhere, I don't remember the exact number, but per square meters, we can have like millions of IPv6 addresses per square meters, uh, square meters, yeah. So we did it such as even if in the future uh, we have whatever needs regarding the IP addresses, they're gonna be enough, all right? Okay, so IP addresses consist of two parts, just like the phone numbers, all right? The third, but here we have a first part, which is called the net ID. We also call it a prefix, and that will ID the network that I belong to. And the reminding of this, this is the host ID, 
and the host ID will ID a host within this network. That's it. So be careful for the host ID. We have two specific values that are cannot be used to ID a host. All zeros mean that the IP address is for the network. All ones is the broadcast address on that network. So you cannot use those specific host IDs for any host. And the notation that we're using is what we call the dotted quad, which means that here we take a byte, we put a dot, we convert it to a decimal, and that's the IP address for humans. Okay. The routers or hosts, they still need the 32 bits. So let's try to understand the reason exactly that in, a, in the internet we do actually that separation between the prefix and the host ID. So let's say you have this network, which is a typical IP network. We have one local network, a second one, and they are connected by routers. And the distance may be super long, right? And so here I can, I can have like multiple other routers. And this is basically how I connect networks together. And as we know, any host, including the routers, they need to have an IP address. For them, one is enough. For routers, I need one IP address per interface. So a router have as many IP addresses per interface. Because once again, an IP address tells which network you belong to. So routers, multiple interfaces, multiple IP addresses. Okay? In our case, for instance, obviously, you know, when you have like a host, you may have multiple interfaces. Like let's say I have my Wi-Fi, my 4G, but a host cannot use them both together. They can only use one at a time. So that's the reason at some point, you only need one IP address on the interface that you are currently using. And the best that we can do now on the smartphones is I'm switching back from 4G to Wi-Fi, depending on what is the bandwidth, what is the cost, and so on. And nowadays, it's really hard, or there's a lot of research trying to say that, oh, I can use both of them, so maybe I can get more bandwidth, right? Could be interesting. There, there, there are some challenges for this. Okay, so let's say, let's make a, a, a stupid assumption here, all right? A very simple assumption that actually the IP addresses are totally random. They are unique, but we allocate the IP addresses totally randomly. So if I look what I need at the router, given that I need the tables, if those IP addresses are totally random, it means that I need one entry per host. So it means that as many hosts that I have, it means that I may need 2 power 32 entries in a router, given that I, I can have up to 4 billion hosts in the internet. So that's not acceptable. Why? Because you see that now, the time that it takes to do the lookup will slow down how fast the packet can be delivered. So if I need to do the lookup of such a big table at each router, each hops, right, it's going to take forever. So that's not a good way. The better way is to say that, okay, so instead of giving the IP addresses to the host, let's first give a network, an address to the network. And you can see that here, the slash 24 is indicating the size of the prefix. So the net ID is 24 bit long, which means that it leaves eight bits for the host ID. So it means that now you see on this side, I have these prefixes. And any host that belong here should share that prefix. And that prefix cannot be used anywhere else. The same goes on the left, on the right, on the left, yes. So as you may see here, you have that prefix. And any host that belongs to those networks can only share this prefix. So which means that now if I look at the table, I only need one entry per network. And so you see that I squeeze the size of the table just because I could aggregate multiple entries in the same in single entry. Can you see that? So I think that's pretty cool. All right, maybe that, that seems pretty obvious. But there's, this is not the only reason, okay, to speed up the lookup in the table, because the table now looks shorter. There's other reasons for this. The other reason is the following. If I go back to that model that we have here, you see that one of the issues is if I need to add a new host here, I will need to update the tables. And I need to do that at all the routers. 
because all the routers have the details of the structure of all the networks. If I remove one, I will also need to do the update everywhere. So it means that I need to tell all the routers, please, that the host missing or there's a new host here. So let's remove or add a new entry. Now, if I do this one, if I add or remove someone, does it gonna affect the table? No, the table is totally remain the same because you don't do the table depending on how many hosts. It's only based on the network. So you see, so this is a second advantage. It means that any change local to a network remain local. So you may update, oops, you may want, oops, oops, sorry, sorry, oh, too far. So you may want to update that, that router here, but the rest of the, the other routers, they don't need to know those details. So that's pretty cool, right? So that's the second reason. So you don't need to send like thousands of updates nowhere. The other thing that is also very interesting is the following, is the fact that now, if I look at the table, I cannot tell what is the structure of the, of the network. I don't have access to the detail of the network if I'm, not, if I'm not the router, the local router of this network. So it means that I can hide the topology information, which is good for security and uh, privacy. And this is only possible because I can aggregate it, all right? Because when, for instance, you want to launch an attack, like your DOS attack, knowing which hosts are existing, it makes things easier, all right? Okay, so three reasons. So here I just show you, I just show you uh, the benefit. So one of the things that we need to answer now that we understand that, okay, let's first use a prefix for the network and then use the host ID to ID each of the hosts on this network. We said that we have a prefix. I told this 24, but why 24? Or basically when I give you the IP address, first of all, I need to define where to put the separation. 24, is it good? Should it be 16? Should it be 26? Right? Is there a rule here of the thumb or something? And the other thing is, once I decided that it should be here, how can I have this information? How can I say that when I send a packet, this packet goes for a network whose prefix is 16-bit mode? So first of all, just to understand how long should be the prefix, um, if I tell you that it's here, so it means that the size of it is 24. Oh, yeah, but it was already 24. What can you tell about how many hosts can I, how many end hosts can be hosted or connected to that network? How many can I connect in total? Yeah, 2 power 8, given that you need always to remove, like, you know, the all zeros and all ones values because you cannot use them. But yes, in total, you can only have 2 power 8 minus 2. So it means that it's two power of 254 host in total. So basically the idea is to say, knowing the size of my network, this is how I should define the size of the prefix. If I have 600 hosts, what should be the size of the prefix? So 22, so 22 means 10, two power 10, how much is two power 10? It should be 10 here and 22 for the prefix, giving the number of hosts. Understood? So this is how you should. Regarding the size of the, of the prefix. So actually, there were two ways of doing this. In the early age of the internet, we use what we call classes. So it means that the IP addresses were divided in three classes, A, B, C. So what does it mean? To know if you belong to which class you belong, we were looking at the first bit of the IP address. So let's say if my IP address start with 132, which class is this? You just need to translate the first bit. So this is written 0B1 for 128 plus, plus zero, right? So the first bits are one zero, so it's a class B. Okay, do you understand how to, uh, how to know the class? You just look at the first bits. You convert the first byte, you look at the first bits, and you know which class it is. Knowing the class actually have a consequence. And what is the consequence of belonging to one of those classes? 
The class, all the IP addresses that belong to a class A, which means that start with a zero, the prefix is already set to eight bits. The class B have a prefix of 16, and the class C is 24. So at the beginning, what we thought, we thought that all the prefixes should be already fixed according to which class we are belonging to. And obviously, that was a very wrong idea. Why? Because let's say you have, if I have a network with, if I have 258 hosts, which network should I use? Class B. Absolutely. But you see that the class B is actually up to 216. 2 power 16. So 64,000 IP addresses. But we didn't have any choice because we could only use one class or the other out of three. So it was a lot of waste. Because I will allocate a class B, and nobody else can use those class Bs, only one site. And you know, like 64,000 IP addresses, I mean, can you believe the size of it? It's huge. I mean, there's no company, no university in the world that can have up to 60,000 hosts running. Okay? So that was wrong. So basically, we said classes, not good. So nowadays, what we do? So the length may have a variable size. It will depend on the needs, on the size of the network. But now, since the IP address is not enough to tell me the size of the prefix, since I don't have any more classes, now any IP address need to come with a mask, which is a special IP address. So you need two now. You need to have your IP plus to provide for each IP a mask. And the mask is a special address where all the, the, the bits of the prefix are set to one. So it means that if I give you here this mask, you can see that because of the 248, it means that 48 can be written 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, and another one here. So what is the size of the prefix that is given by this? Is a slash 21. Okay, so now this is the only way to, first of all, have a prefix with the size that is a suitable one, that is consistent with the size of my network. And in order to indicate what is the size of the prefix, I should have the mask. Okay, so this information and the fact that I can have a slash 21 is the same. In both cases, I will need to provide the mask. Okay, so let's take an example. So let's say we use classes. Like we are back in the 80s. The classes were telling me that, okay, so we have this IP address. Let me look at the first bit. Oh, the first bit is a zero. It means that the class is, it's A, it means that the prefix is 8 bit long. So which means that now, if I want to have the network IP address is the first byte followed by only zeros. And that is the IP address of my network. Let's say now I do classless. It means that classless, I need to provide you a mask. Without the mask, you cannot tell about the prefix. If here the mask is 248, what it means? It means that 240, 248, am I wrong here? I don't know. Anyway, 21, 1 plus 3, uh, 2, 3. Yes, it's good. So which means that now the prefix is 21 bits long because I count how many ones are set to 1. And out of this, I can tell you that the network IP, the network address is this one. Okay, so you see the two different ways, given that now we don't do classes anymore. Understood how the mask can help you doing this? That's it. So, and here's the IP, the IP address of the network. Okay, so this is called the CIDR, using the mask. And having prefixes that actually are not already predetermined by a class is much better when it comes to how well you're using the IP addresses. Why? Because as I said, right, it means that instead of doing what we do, so for instance, if we have classes, it means that if you have more than 65,534, you need to use a class A. And you go from 65,000 to 60 million IP addresses. That's crazy. 
it have to be a middle ground, a middle ground here, right? Although, so that is Apple. Apple have a class A. Why? I'm not talking about IPs used by the iPhones, right? I'm talking about Apple in Cupertino. Do you think that they have 60 million people working for them and using a net? Uh, no, of course not. But they were here in the in the beginning. MIT too. MIT is using a class A. Why? Because they were involved in the internet in the beginning. In the beginning, we were not expecting that actually there's going to be such a need for IP addresses. So the, we were giving them like randomly, you know? Anyway, so for instance, the same if you look at Sorbonne, Sorbonne, we have two class Bs. Two class Bs means that I have up to a, hundred, a little over 100,000 addresses. We only use 10% of them, even though it's, it's quite a large campus in Paris. And it's a waste. Okay, so that's the reason anybody have a doesn't have, use a private IP address. Everybody have a public IP address because we need to use them. Right? Anyway, so the CIDR instead of allocating the class, we're going to allocate based on the real needs of the network. So if I know how many hosts, based on the number of hosts, I will be able to motivate which prefix should I use. Okay, very simple. So once again. The IP address come with a mask, okay? So it means that the mask can be provided either through this way, but most of the time for the questions, instead of handling the mask, uh, people get used to that, but it doesn't mean that it replaces the mask. This is exactly the same information, but the presentation is a little different, right? So as I said, so 220, so it means that actually the number of hosts is 2 power 11 minus 2, 2046. And so here are the, the relevant information. So I have the mask, okay? It give us the size of the prefix, which is here. So if I have all ones, this is the network address. And I can have also a specific address, which is the broadcast, the local broadcast. And the local broadcast is basically if I put all ones here. So it's gonna be 12 34 dot so it's going to be 159 dot all ones. What are the all ones? 255. So this is the IP address of the, of the broadcast. Okay, I put all the, all the bits of the host ID at one. When it's all zeros, this is a network, ID, a network address. If I put the host ID with all ones, it goes for the local broadcast on that network. When I send a packet, that packet is supposed to be received by all the hosts belonging to that network. Okay, so one of the things also that are, that are quite common that we may do, okay, in order to uh, be able to handle class Bs, which are huge, as we explained. So since IP address should be used on one physical network, and which is not possible, so some admins, what they do, when you have a site, and this site consists of multiple networks, but they still belong to the same campus, let's say, so what they're going to do, they're going to actually subdivide this prefix, which is a slash 16, in multiple sub-networks by using, let's say, here three bits will be used as the subnet ID. And so within each of those prefixes now, which are long 19, okay? you see that I can allocate by dividing the class B in multiple sub-networks, I will be able to allocate each of them to each subnet. So here in total, if I have three bits, eight, yes. And be careful for the subnet ID, no need to remove the all zeros and all ones. For the subnet ID, I can use any value, including all zeros and all ones. No problem with this. And on each, each subnet, up to how many hosts can I have? If the prefix is 19, how many bits left for the host ID? T13, so 2 power 13 minus, minus two. 2. Okay, so it's way over two, uh, 5 or 30, right? It's 2 power 13, because we said that 19 is for the prefix, the new prefix, and whatever is left is for the host ID, okay, which is 13. All right, so that is when I have a class B. Let's say now I have a class C, 
the prefix 24 and 8 bit for the host side. So I can have up to 2 power, 50, uh, 2 power 54 hosts, which is quite small actually. So let's say, oh, one class C is not enough. I'm not happy with this. Well, what you can do is actually you can be allocated multiple class C's. And if the classes actually are contiguous, okay, you see that each of them follow the next one. I can actually aggregate all of them and have a prefix which is shorter than 24. So what I mean by that is if you aggregate two, you see that you have one aggregation. If you aggregated four, you have one. If you aggregated five, you see? So this is how you can, by aggregating multiple classes, you can end up having multiples of 254. You understand? So let's look at the, at the big picture now. So I'm starting when I do subnetting, I take a slash 16 and I divide it in multiple blocks, depending on how, how many do I need. Okay, so I went through, I'm sorry. I went through a quite large, uh, large, large uh, network, which is a slash 16. And I extend the size of the prefix to have multiple subnets. In the class of the, what we call the supernetting, I'm taking multiple classes and I aggregate them. The first level, I'm gonna have a slash 23. Then if I aggregate four, oh no, no four, sorry. Uh, yeah, it should be four. Yeah, yeah. If I aggregate four here, I have a slash 22. And if I aggregate them all, I have a slash 21. So you see, so either you have multiple classes and you can aggregate them, or you have a class B and you can subdivide in multiple subnets. So those two approaches are very popular. Okay. And so for instance, NYU is doing this because even NYU have a slash 16, Sorbonne have two slash 16. So most of the universities, like big universities have class Bs. Okay. And what they do, they subdivide them by using a mask that is longer than the prefix provided by the class, B, which is 16 bits. So I need to extend. All right. So actually we don't do it only on one organization, we can do that at multiple levels in the network. And so it means that I can do multiple aggregation, which means that on the top, I can see like multiple networks all around the US as one prefix. And that is the purpose of CIDR. So actually, if you read the documentation provided by CIDR, the purpose was to reallocate all the IPv4 addresses depending on if you were in Europe, in France, in Africa, in Asia, in such a way that you can aggregate them and you can see a whole, like, all North America as one single prefix. Of course, it was not possible because it would require many networks to renumber the networks. So it failed to achieve so well, but CIDR was provided as a midterm, a midterm solution before IPv6. So let's see what, what it means. So when I'm an ISP, so as an ISP, I may have a bigger provider. So that provider gonna give me a sub block of the slash 16, which is here slash 21. And this ISP may have multiple clients, which are organization. And depending on their needs and how much they wanna pay, because the more IP address you need, the more you need to pay, you know, it's valuable. So they will be allocated with a sub block of the slash 21. And so each of them, here I have multiple classes, will allocate those, those IPs locally to the network. So it means that from outside, I see all of these as the slash 16. And all of that is seen as the slash 20. So you see by aggregation, all I need to do when I route a packet to this location, is to know the route to the slash 21. If I need more details, so then I will look inside the local table of this net router to know about the detail of each of those files. So you see, so the closer you're getting from the destination, the more information are available to take the routing decisions. All right. 
So that's pretty handy, okay? And so I'm sorry, this one is terrible. I should uh, redo it again. So each router knows some details. And by aggregation, one is only available. So I'm sorry, they're not, it's somewhere here, all right? And this one is this 23, so it's not available. But anyway, you see by aggregating at multiple levels, each routing table gets smaller, 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 smaller. Okay, and the prefixes are getting shorter, shorter, shorter. Okay, as you get you get up in the hierarchy of the internet. Okay, so you go through multiple ISPs until you reach what we call the backbone, with the big ISPs such as Sprint, UUNet. There are many of them, PCW in Hong Kong and so on. And those guys, they have like big routers who got a lot of routes and a lot of them are aggregated. Anyway, so just to show you uh, what it means, it means that the CIDR was, I don't know if I, I don't, I don't have a legend, but it's here. So CIDR was introduced at this point. So you see in the mid 90s. And you need to zoom, but basically you see that if you, the increase was going this way. So actually we saw that if we let it happen as it was in the beginning of the 90s, which means that it, when we open up the internet to the public, we were, we were running into troubles. So that's the reason this is where we introduced CIDR. And as you may see, ever since, I mean, yes, at the beginning it was flat, then in, the, in 2000, you remember, it was like all the startups were going big and everybody wanted to get uh, in the internet for a business. Then we have the bubble. So a lot of them crash of those startups. So they lost business. So they release the IPs and say, we don't need the IPs anymore. So the table gets smaller. And ever since, if you look at the increase, so it's sometimes is linear, sometimes it goes up. So if you do just, this is the latest I could find, but nowadays, if we try to identify how are the table increasing, well, it goes from exponential back to linear and so on. So right now we are in the, you know, in the gray zone. We cannot say that actually we are successful or either, but for sure in the future, we will need to move to IPv6, right? So those are IPv4 tables. Some ISPs are running already IPv6 and they have less of those problems. All right. Okay, so, uh, so what about allocating a prefix? So how do you get a prefix, basically? Okay, so we said that, oh, I have this prefix, but how do I get it? Well, actually, what you should know is that on the top of the internet, we have a central office, which is called the ICAM. Okay, and those guys are in charge of the names, our own numbers that we use in the internet port numbers, uh, the values of the protocols, I mean, a lot of stuff, including the IP addresses. And obviously, those guys, they cannot be in charge of all the IPs for all the world. So what they do, actually, they divide that the two power 32 IP addresses in multiple blocks, and they allocate it into registries, so local administrations that are in charge of each of the part of the world. So North America is the area. Uh, RIPE, is for Europe and Russia. So each of them having allocated an IP, a large block of IPv4 addresses, and each of them allocate them to either ISPs, okay, or some institutions such as universities or local public networks, all right? So you see, so multiple levels. So at the top of have the ICANN. The ICANN delegate some IP addresses, or some blocks of IP addresses to uh, local uh, heroes, right? Who then distribute the IP addresses to ISPs, okay? And go so on. Um, even ISPs can have their own clients who get who are ISPs as well. So you see, so there are multiple level of delegation. What you should know by now, that no more IPs, no more IPs, no more IPs, no more IPs. The only place where we still have few IPv4 addresses is the Afrinic. All the rest, gone. No more IPv4. So what you try to do, you move IPs from one to another. For instance, like, I don't remember, last time it was Walmart. Walmart released a lot of IPv4 addresses when they closed some of their uh, headquarters and so on. So some IPv4 addresses moved from one company to another. See, so this is what is happening nowadays. 
Okay, you are reselling IP addresses from one company to another. That's it. So that's the business of IPv4 addresses. So on top of this, I didn't say that we have like specific IP addresses. So all zeros is a specific one that I can use for a very short period where I try to learn my IP. So as I said, normally you need to contact your box, your internet box, to learn what is the IP you should use. During that period of learning your IP address, you can use the all zeros until you learn your final address. Okay. Then we have the broadcast address. We already talked about the old ones, but when you use the 32 bits to one, you can send a packet locally, and everybody else on the same network as you are gonna receive that packet. Okay, this is the broadcast, the local. So it means that router is gonna block those packets. Then we have the loopback, and the loopback is very interesting. Whenever you test a program and you do local host, local host in Python, this is the IP that you're gonna use. So basically what is happening here, you're going to go all the way down your layers and before you loop back again. So this is just to test when you're going to traverse the layers without putting some traffic on the network, which can be dangerous if you haven't tested your network, your application. So this is a loop back. Then we have the link local. So some of you, including those who use Windows, if you fail in contacting the DHCP, you will still be allocated with a local IP address, which is a 69254, which is a special IP that is, can be used only for local communication on the network without those packets going outside of the network. Okay, so this is in case where you fail into getting uh, an a, a IP address. And then we will see that in two weeks, uh, in two weeks, yeah, we have the private IP addresses, which means that if you don't have a public IP address available for you, okay, what you may do is use a private IP address. So there are, as you may see, few of them have been defined already. And most of the time, this is the one that you can see. And if you are on the campus in Pudong or even in, uh, in Brooklyn, in, the, in, in New York, this is probably the IP address that's going to be allocated to you. It's a private one, right? It's not public. Is that correct? I think so. But even in your house, this is the one that you're using. Why? Because basically your ISP is giving you one public IP address. This public IP address is used by your box. So no more public IP address. So what you should do, you should use a private. And we will see that the box will actually translate your private IP to the public. And so it means that the private address is going to be removed, replaced by the public, and back again when you receive the response. Anyway, I'll go into those details. But just rem remember that we have specific IP addresses which indicate that those are private. They're only for local use. Okay? All right. So obviously, I cannot end this part of the chapter bef before saying that 2 power 32 is not enough. Okay? That's not enough. Nowadays, we are running out of IPv4 addresses, given that even my rice cooker have an IP address. I don't know yours. But my rice cooker have an IP address from Xiaomi, from uh, Xiaomi yeah. Uh, no, yeah, Xiaomi, yeah, yeah. So it have an IP address. So nowadays, everything that is electrified have an IP address. So that's very simple. Okay, whatever you buy and comes powered by electricity, it's so easy to uh, actually add a wireless uh, interface. So if you have a wireless interface, you can have an IP address. Great. So as long as you have so many devices now that use um, IP addresses. So what is your good question? What is it called IPv6? No, oh, yeah, a good question. Yeah. I, will, I, I will try to answer in a minute. So well, we moved to IPv6. So actually, it was not supposed to be called IPv6. It was supposed to be called IPNG, next generation. And basically, there were so many proposals that some of them have been merged together. And so since we lost. Uh, the v5 because it was already running and it's been aggregating with other we skip five and we move to uh, to ipv6 straight off but from v4 there were so many proposals okay that actually when we merge some of them we move to v6 uh, direct okay uh, what is interesting actually is to know that it's been um, I don't know yeah well send some text messages to me yeah yeah yeah, the rice cooker is very talkative. 
anyway, so basically uh, what you need to know is actually uh, V6 was ready since the mid 90s. It was already available and the final version was still there. So it means that all routers that you bought from the 90s or even your operating system since uh, Windows, uh, I, don't, I don't even know the ver with version or even for Mac OS, but version six is already available, but nobody's using it or not enough people. So the reason for this, we're going to study in the chapter on IPv6. I will have a couple of slides on this. Maybe it's interesting to you guys. And so because of all those problems, we need to fix the issue of V4 without using V6. And so in the middle, what we have, we introduce the private IP addresses using an at and uh, the, the extended use of DHCP. So all of this was a way of mitigating the problem and waiting for IPv6 to be introduced in the future. But I don't see it happening anytime soon. Okay. All right. So that's it about the IP address. I want to talk a little about the forwarding. So uh, should I take some questions? So let's talk about the forwarding. So as I said, when a router receives a packet, there's a bunch. Of, uh, there's a couple of things that need to happen on the header. We're going to discuss about it once we will know about the uh, the structure of the header. What are the fields inside the header? But mostly what you need to do is based on the destination IP address, you need to look up inside the table. And based on the information available in the table, you're going to tell what is the next hope. Then you need to go inside a queue until the interface is available, because maybe it's already busy okay, transmitting another packet. Okay? So, what is important here is to see that whenever you need to check the table or to put the packet in the buffer, you need to do input output in your memory. And that takes a long time. Okay? Those access, they are basically the bottleneck here. So what we want to try to do is to minimize how often do we access a table, such as we don't need to look up all the table Still, we know the interface. So we want to speed up that search, the lookup. So once again, inside the table, so each destination IP addresses are mapped to a given interface. So when you receive the packet, you extract the IP address of the destination. You use it as an index in, to look up inside the table. And once you know the interface, you're going to forward the packet. And each router, that's what they're going to do, hope by hope, OK? Hope by hope. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm showing you. Knowing that the table, as I said, is the output, either it's created manually, but most of the time it's created out of the routing protocol. Right? So one of the problems that we may have nowadays, before with the classes we didn't have, it means that you remember that basically because of the classes, it was pretty simple actually, when you receive a packet based on the class of the destination, I knew exactly which prefix I was looking for. So if the IP address was the class A, I would look inside the table for a prefix which is 8-bit long. If the IP of the destination was a class B, I would look for a prefix that is 16-bit long. So it was quite straightforward to do this. But nowadays, we have this kind of problem. And let's look at this example here. So what do I have? I have a customer, OK? So we have a customer. And this customer is using this slash 23. It has been allocated by one provider, this provider, the red one, OK? But you know, to me, let's say as D, I have a company. And it's really important that every day I can answer to the emails. I can have a hotline running, uh, checking messages, uh, doing calls on Zoom or Skype. So my connection is gold. That's all the money. So what should I do? If I lose a connection, what should I do? I should be able to access the internet or receive packets through another connection. And that's what people do when they have two cell phones with two SIM cards. Right? I need to be reachable. But if you have two SIM cards, people should know you through your two phone numbers. 
So what we do here in the internet, some clever providers, they say, okay, no worries. As a provider, I'm going to use your slash and I'm going to advertise it. So it means that they're going to advertise the 201, 10, 6, 23. So it means that I have one route that goes this way and I have the green one that goes this way for that destination. So now inside the table for the client D, how many entries? Two. Two routes instead of one. And the routers, actually, they get fooled because since the prefix is not the same length, they say, oh, those are two different destinations. All right. So now the router is receiving a packet. He have two choices. Which way should I go? Should I go green or red? Is the red better or the green or the opposite? Actually, you know, those two paths have been selected based on the same criteria. So it means that there's not a good path and a bad path. The two paths are the good. Because I calculated those paths the same way. But I need to make a choice. I'm not going to cut the packet in two and split it in two parts and send it on to the two paths. And you may tell me that, yeah, but we can do like some clever load sharing, you know, balance the load. But then I need to do 50 50. And I need to count the packets. Who can do that, right? It's going to take too much time. So actually, no. I'm repeating in the internet, we do single path router, single path router, uh, forwarding. So it means that I need to select one. And yes, the good answer was green. Why? Because in the table, I have two choices. And the choice that we make is we compare the size of the prefix, and we're going to take the longest one. So 23 is longer than 21. So the green one is a winner. So why do we do the longest? There's no really a good reason for this, but we do the longest, okay? So once again, if I get into the table and this is my destination, I'm going to check all the entries. Those ones share the same prefix. So those two are candidates. This one have a longer matching prefix. I'm going to use this one. And that's the red one. Uh, no, that's a green one. Oh, my God. It's a green one. All right, that's the way it is, okay? So basically now, what I mean by that, the thing is, let's say I'm doing a lookup of the table. I fall on this entry. Can I stay, can I say, EPO, yeah, I have the, the one entry, I should go this way. No, because now what they're asking me, they say, whoa, 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 you need to make sure that this is the longest one. So to make sure that it's the longest one, what, should, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed now to do the lookup of all the table and compare all the entries to make sure that it was the longest. So you see those now, the lookup will take so much time because of the cider, because now multiple prefixes may match the same IP address. And that's the pain in the neck. You understand? So that's the reason the solution that was found. So this is the, the problem of the lookup. So you see that here, those two are okay, but we need to find the longest. So it means that when I have a huge table, and that's an example, I need to go all the way down to realize that actually I need to go all the way back because that's one that's not mapped. Right. So in the worst case scenario, I need to look up the whole table. And that takes too much time. So that's the reason the people thought about, so you know, probably if you took like data structure courses, you remember that doing the lookup may be improved using some algorithms and there are some very efficient algorithms for instance when you need to search in a tree for instance right when you organize the data in the tree you can you know you have some very uh, optimal uh, how to say optimal uh, algorithms that will have a very limited complexity to do this and this is exactly what we're doing so for instance one of the things that we do is we use what we call the Patricia, Patricia try, and try comes from the word of retrieval. When you want to do information retrieval, so they have like very famous algorithms 
where they're going to organize the IP address. So you see you have all your prefixes here. You're going to organize them as a tree. And of course, the purpose is to limit the height of the tree because the deeper is the tree, the more time you need to jump until you reach one of the leaves. Because you see that the final prefixes are given by the leaves, the end nodes. So the shorter, the better. So here, I'm not going to get into the details. If you want to read a little bit more about this, it would be very interesting for you to do this. But you're going to organize. So you're going to start by indicating what is the first bit that is different in the IP address. So let's see. The first bit, we have only once. So we can skip that one. Because actually, it won't tell me if I should go left or right. So I should skip and move to the second bit. And you see that if I have the second bit, it can be either 1 or 0. If it's zero, I'm going to search on the left. If it's one, I'm going to go on the right. So if it's one, you can see that there are actually only one entry start with 11. So I can put all of it. So one of the way of doing this is using this kind of tree. So I can, I can send you more examples for you to get used to it. But basically what we are saying is we're looking at the first bits. And as you may see, everybody is sharing the same bit. The first bit is one. So which means that it won't tell you if you should move right, right, right or left. The, bit, the first bit that actually is going to be significant or relevant to move left is the second one. So that's the reason here I'm going to indicate, please jump to the second bit. And if the second bit is 0, you go this way. If it's 1, you go this way. So let's look. If I have a 1, I only can have this one. So I can strictly say P1. So which means that when you reach that point, What's going to happen? I'm going to compare. So if I had basically an IP address which was 110, for instance, oh, it doesn't match. So let me go backwards. So I fail. So if I have 110, can I, do I have any entry that is matching it? No, I need to drop the packet. Right? Let's say now let's look at the seconds. If it's zero, I can have either time 10 star. 10, 10 star, 10, 10 star 1. So here the IP addresses are quite small. So if you organize this, this is what you're going to get, right? Those branches. So it, the height is small, and you know which way you should look up to search inside this table. So this is a very efficient way to speed up the lookup. All right? So I can get into more details if you need, but it's out, it's out of scope of a, of a bachelor course. But if you want to read more, I will tell you. So as a conclusion, because I don't want to keep you uh, so late, guys. So the IP addresses are 32 bit long if it's in DIN 4. In V6, we said it's 128. You allocate the IP addresses giving a prefix. So first, you allocate the prefix to the network. And based on that network prefix, you're going to start numbering each of the hosts using a host ID. The hierarchy actually is non-uniform. So it means that you may have a prefix which have a variable length. So in order to tell what is the size of the prefix? Actually, you use the mask. Okay, that's now you have to. Okay, you cannot do any different because we don't have classes anymore. When it comes to forwarding, we do forwarding based on the prefix, and because of CIDR, we may have multiple matching prefixes. And so, if we have multiple choices, we always should send the packet using the longest matching prefix, and that's the way we do forwarding. So which means that it increases the lookup. So having the table stored using a specific structure that will uh, help in searching faster the table is much more uh, efficient. And that's the reason we use tries, because the tries are very efficient for the search Okay, when it comes to binary 